you're changing by reducing or eliminating tillage. And we're going to talk about what tillage does to the soil. I mean, cover crops are also added to thousands of acres in, in Tennessee. And I also have a contract in Iowa. So I'm also preaching the gospel in Iowa. And we got many people starting to put cover crops even in the state of Iowa. So improving soil health reduces soil erosion. We know that. It improves water quality, air quality. Many of the goals of NRCS, conservation districts, and extension, and improving soil health improves human life too. So as I've dri driven the state of Tennessee, and especially in Halls Crossroads, Knox County, Tennessee, I still see this happening. Now you may already be almost no-till, using straw, using a lot of these practices, but I see this still in my area in just north of Knoxville. In many gardens, they'll hire somebody to come, they'll do a no more plow. Then they'll come out and hit it a couple of times with a disc. Then they'll come back with a rototiller. And then so uh, many of these gardens receive several cultivations during the year. So the, the garden is being pulverized. And so uh, we're seeing this, and that sector is our home gardens. So as I see on the landscape, most of the tillage today are around home gardens or specialty crops. So that's why I'm real fired up about this campaign. So soil health is the continued capacity to function. Now when we were in our soils classes, Dr. Anderson, uh, a few years ago, we talked about dynamic soil properties. And these are some of these properties that can change due to management. Soil organic matter, uh, aggregate stability, uh, bulk density, some of these things, but the bottom line for you all is, is how well is this soil functioning? And we want to talk about when water falls, is the soil infiltrating, or do you have to water it every week, or is water standing when you get a rain? So we want the water to hit the soil, move into the soil, and then throughout the soil profile, we want to cycle nutrients. We, we, we may still use fertilizer, we may still use organic amendments in that, but we want to cycle through the carbon cycle as much as possible, and that's why we're doing this push. So in the ideal soil, you have your mineral matter here on the right, you have, and this is from a textbook in soils, so you have what would be ideally 5% soil organic matter, which we don't have a lot in Tennessee, but with soil health, we are starting to see some 5% organic matter. And then on the left side, we have what we call the porosity side, the airspace for water and air. So if we do a sorry job and we kill our soil and we compact our soil and we lose our porosity side, we reduce organic matter due to tillage and other practices, then what we have left is mineral matter and we're treating our soil like dirt. And we don't want to treat our soil like dirt. It's a living organism that can give us a lot of benefits through functions of soil. So the basic part is getting into photosynthesis. So we want sunshine and we must have green plants. So green plants will take in through sunshine, chlorophyll, through carbon dioxide, and we make carbon into a plant or simple sugars. And then plants will leak and that's the beautiful thing about plants. They will leak in the root system this protein sugar mix. It's got some protein, it's got sugar in it, and the soil biology will start to break this down and they'll start to increase as long as we have green plants. So we gotta have sunshine, which we do, thank God. We have green plants and that will be up to you. Are we just gonna have our tomato plants out there, our okra? our asparagus, our lettuce, or are we going to extend the season 365 days a year, 24-7, by growing cover crops? And that's why we are promoting this, to keep something growing all the time. So you got sunshine, then you produce carbon, and you have this live plant, you have the roots that are leaking these sugars, and then eventually they slough off, they die, we have organic material, and as the microorganisms, the bacteria, the fungi, and then the larger critters like nematodes, orthopods, earthworms, and all that, 
breaks down this tissue to a smaller, so the bacteria and fungi can break that down into that dark stuff we see in the soil called soil organic matter or soil carbon. So that's what we want. We take sunshine, we take green plants, and you have soil life, and that starts that carbon cycle. So there's five, there's five principles I'm going to talk about. There's four basic ones, then I'm going to add some, one to it. So the first rule to improve soil health is disturb as little as possible. And generally, we're talking about tillage. So whether it's a rototiller, whether it's a disc, whether it's a field cultivator, a uh, turbo till, whatever it is, when you break down soil aggregates, you, you, you break down that porosity that was on the left side of the pie chart a while ago. So we want to disturb as little as possible. Number two, in a pasture sitting on the right or a cropland sitting on the left, we want to keep the soil covered. In natural ecosystems, in uh, East Tennessee, Middle Tennessee, we normally would be in a deciduous forest. And so as we come into an agriculture setting, we want to emulate that forest by having multi-species. That's why you'll get a bag today with multi-species. And also, we want to keep it covered through the cropping system. So let's say you harvest your garden, and many of you may already be doing this. You leave the residue of the garden on the soil surface. Then you would plant a cover crop, or I hope after today you would. And then here we have a rotor crimper knocking it down. Here we have a grazing system where we bring in multi-animals on multi-species, and we're keeping the soil covered. This gives us insulation of the soil. This gives us the food supply for the soil biology, and it gives us protection when that raindrop falls about 30 miles per hour. It's the soil. If we have that buffer, that armor, it's going to protect, protect the soil from that also. And then we want to keep a live root growing, or more simply, we want to keep a plant growing. And as I go out with a shovel, it blows my mind that as long as we have something growing, and as long as we uh, did rule number one, we reduce tillage, and as we keep the soil covered, so we get to this point keeping live roots growing, we have what we call an aggregated soil or soil aggregates, a granular, crumbly aggregate, which is uh, the best way I can describe an aggregate would be if we had a jar of marbles. And the marbles would be a aggregated with, soil, uh, with sand, silt, and clay aggregated into a, a large conglomerate of these soil particles. And you put them in a jar, and you pour water, and that water goes through that. That's the porosity that I was talking about. So we want to keep a live root growing to feed the biology to aggregate the soil as they go through their decomposition. Now, as I go out in fields, and I see a soil that is bare for any reason, Maybe they didn't get a good stand to cover crop, or maybe their crop was drowned out. But if you'll find a bare spot in your garden, if you'll take your shovel and dig it up, it will be what we would call a massive or no structure. There's no aggregates that you can see, the little round uh, things that I'm calling aggregates. And when you see a nice soil, those little round things you're seeing, those are nice granular aggregates. So we will not see that when the plant is not actively growing. So I've, I've come up with this motto, when you don't have a green plant growing, then your soil is degrading. We have to have plants growing in order to keep this soil aggregation and this soil health going. And then the fourth rule is we're emulating the forest again, is diversity. And whether you have... Uh, Cover crops like we're talking about, crimson clover, rye, radish, stitch, combined together, or you do some rotation or all that, you want to be as diverse as possible. And with you in your garden, one thing I'm not going to teach you how to do is to garden. Y'all are probably some master gardeners. So you know to do some rotation within your garden. And so within that garden itself, where I'm going to come in and talk, is the science of soil health and then this cover crop mix that we'll talk about on in the presentation. So within your garden, you'll want to rotate, you know, your corn one year over here and your tomatoes over here and your 
cucumbers and your watermelons and move them around, but you want diversity from your cover crop in the wintertime, and that's why we're going as much, uh, we're going at least five species, and we're giving you five species of this cover crop mix. And then lastly is number five, and this would be any type of organic amendment. Some people put grass clippings on their yard during the season to choke out weeds. Some people put straw out, and I'm going to talk about that. Manure, composted manure, compost from your trash can or whatever during the year. So anything that was growing at one time, that was alive at one time, would be an organic amendment, and that would be the fifth of these rules to help your soil health. And then, now let's talk about this campaign and what we're going to offer you. So the TACD crop campaign, uh, I asked the state, I said, how many people would be interested in me coming and doing a meeting and or do you want some seed? And I think we had three to four districts that said, we want you seed, we don't want you. I said, that's fair. But 11 of the districts says we want you and we want the seed. So it's been very successful because we just started this. We gave them a July 1st deadline. And so we have about 11 meetings starting with this one and ending, I think, October the 18th or something with one up in Van Buren County with a school system. So it's been very popular. So I took a mix that is very popular with our tech guide. So NRCS has a technical guide and a cover crop standard. So we've taken that cover crop standard and we took what would be a 25 pounds or 22 pounds and I said, okay, I've got to make some adjustments because I cannot walk around with 50 pound bags. Number one, I can't afford it. And number two, can you imagine me giving out 60 bags of 50 pound bags today? I, I just couldn't do it. So we came up with a five pound bag we try to get as close to that acre per rate as possible. So on your bag, we have a little sticker that will tell you all this information. So we'll have a pound and a half of cereal rye. Cereal rye, if you will allow it to get near uh, what we call maturity, it will be taller than me. So you can make some adjustments. You can, and we'll talk about when you kill it and how you want to kill it, but a lot of people will get it this high. The more carbon you can produce, as a shorter amount of time, the quicker you will change your soil health in your gardens. Now, it's easier to manage a cover crop this high than this high. So you'll make some adjustments as you get into this. But I'm going to show you in the slides today, we can manage this much. I'll just give you some procedures on how. But that will be up to you. I'm not going to tell you how to garden. I'm going to tell you how to change your soil health by this management system. Then oats is a little quicker germinating. It doesn't have quite the winter hardiness of the rye. They both have what we call a lethopathy. It is a cool word to say. It's a natural herbicide for little germinating weeds. So if you'll grow this cover crop, lay it down, you will be able to choke out a lot of weeds, whether you're organic or using a little chemical or whatever. Uh, our school winter pea is a nice, vigorous growing Legume, it will be the dark green round, looks like a pea, because it is a pea, in your cover crop bag. So we've got one pound in this mix. And then daikon radishes, we normally recommend up to no more than two pounds per acre, usually a half pound to a pound, pound and a half. Same thing with turnips. So we put a spoonful of that in your mix. So you'll have radishes, turnips. Now ladies, if you got this near the house, when radishes will freeze out about January the 10th, when we get 15, 7, it stinks to high heaven for a little while. So if you are near the house, just know that for a few days, it will have a little sulfur dioxide smell right after it freezes. So I'm not going to give you my address and phone number, but I do want you to know radishes is a great cover crop, but I will warn you that when it freezes a little bit, you might have a little stinky smell. Turnips, it's your garden, so if you get a, you got a little turnip greens, you want to pick a little bit while your cover crop's growing. You've got a few little turnips there because this is going to be a massive cover crop, and you'll see some pictures of it in a minute. 
She can get the deed done with a broadcast uh, yard spreader. Some people may get good results by putting a little pelleted line in it to make your cover crop seat go out. Remember, you got some little fellas, you got some big fellas. So putting out something as a carrier may help you get a little better mix on that. So as you play around with this, you'll get better and better as you continue to do it. Now I'm going to take you through some quasi of the, these principles and some of them uh, pure principles to reach our ultimate goal to do health. So I, I don't know these people, but someone sent me this picture. So this is a yard near a shed, and they wanted to get away from plowing. So they wanted to do a garden, and so they have this grass that's growing. And they said, well, we don't want to use Roundup. We don't want to kill this chemically. We're going to try to be quasi-organic. And so they put straw down, and you can see they're putting it down very thick. You remember my photosynthesis slide. What must you have in order to make photosynthesis? Sunlight. So if we choke it out with a tarp, black plastic, or straw, you can kill some of your cover crops or your grasses. If you want to go from your yard right into a garden and never plow it and get all the benefits of all those long years of grass, you could do something like this and never plow your ground and start to convert into a garden. This is one way to do it. Now everything I'm going to show you, there's 10 ways to skin a cat. Everything I'm showing you, there's as many ways to do it as there are people, but these are some popular ways that work. So here's the finished product. You can see it's a real small area, corner of a yard. They have that about a foot thick in order to kill the grass by blocking the photosynthesis or the sunlight. There's the finished product. You got a nice mulch there. My son has a little garden about four miles outside of D.C. And I've got him into this first step of putting straw. He wasn't plowing. It was kind of a mulch bed that they developed their garden. I said, well, let's go with straw. So I was up when their baby was born in November. Everybody was going to the hospital, so I went and got a bell of straw. So I got him in this system. He didn't realize it. So I was kind of deceitful in that. So I've got him to this point. Now I'm going to give him a bag of these seed, and I'm going to get him in the pepper crops. But this is one way you can see this is as pure no-till as you can get. You put the straw down, you did that. So that, that is a good system. Now what is missing from this system based on my presentation so far? What is missing in the winter time on this system in order to give you as much soil health as possible? What did I say you have to have all the time? Green plant growing. So we have it in the summertime but so they've done the straw, so what they need to come back is as this is playing out, they can mow this residue, do the cyclone seeding of the cover crop, leave the straw, the seed will penetrate, get you a good cover crop, then you can put straw back on top once you kill the cover crop next year, and that will continue to choke out weeds, and we'll talk about that for weed control. Uh, are you still here, Alan? This is Alan. Alan, raise your hand. This is Alan's garden. This is a mature cover crop, right ready to terminate, grow, whatever he would do. You can see, uh, you have how many species in this garden? Eight, nine, ten? Probably nine. So this is a little more than what you're all going to receive and see, but the tallest stuff there is the cereal rye. So you can tell I'm 6'2", all right, Eddie? I would walk out there and it'd be over my head. So this is what one would look like. And I think he said he's about a 25 by 40 or a 30 by 40 garden. So you can see uh, this is, we can do this in these small gardens. So this is the guy that he normally works with in Coffee County. He's the district conservationist, Mr. Adam Daugherty. And he's standing in a field of what we call sun hemp. And it is a lagoon, and he grew this as a monoculture. And then that's when we started digging, Dr. Anderson, in these monoculture lagoons. And we started finding out that just one season of a lagoon, the soil biology were cannibalized by going into the aggregate itself, pulling the glues and sugars, and taking away that soil aggregate in one season. 
So we don't want to go with a monoculture lagoon. We want to add a grass to it because that soil biology is like us. They want that. They want that carbohydrate to give them energy. So you got to produce a carbohydrate, which is grass, with these legumes, and that's why we give you that mix. Now this is the uh, retired state conservationist, Mr. Kevin Brown. He's led this state into soil health for the last four to five years. He retired this last January. So this is his place back in March. And I did a story, and um, uh, I don't know if my website's on this or not. Yes, there's a website on your seed bag that says tnacd.org. So Tennessee Association of Conservation District dot organization will take you to, if you go to the newsroom, I just did a story about a month ago on Kevin Brown and his no-till gardening. So a lot of the principles that I've talked about today, you can go and see it in action. This is in March, and he has about 10 to 12 species. You can see about March, the cover crop's about this high. Sunshine's starting to come, things are starting to grow. Two to three weeks, two weeks later, you can see it's hitting you maybe in the waist. So again, all the species growing there, you got a lot of flowering starting. He keeps a lot of flowers to the side, wildflowers to bring in a lot of beneficial insects so you don't have to use insecticides. There it is at time of bloom. We're getting into mid-April now, starting to hit you in the head. You can see the massiveness. This is Ethiopian cabbage sticking its head out. It's a beautiful brassica. And so you all have turnips and radishes as brassica, but he uses a he uses a Ethiopian cabbage. Kevin is about my height. There he is, and he does he does some organic principles, but he'll still use some Roundup and uh, just a little bit. But he's using some Roundup here to kill it. He has used. Uh, I'll show you some other ways to kill it in a minute. And the extension has a little. Uh, uh, bulletin back there on how to kill it if you're organic. This is what I call a poor man's uh, roller crimper. You can take a two by four piece of angle iron with some bungee cord or rope and basically you just pull it like this. And as you pull that cover crop down you'll come in in one direction and then you would plant, put your transplants or whatever and you can use a screwdriver, you can use a, a yard edger, Anything that will cut into the soil to seed or the method you are using now, you just got cover on the ground instead of just soil. So this is a poor man's rotor crimper. This, they, have, they show a larger rotor crimper extension, but this is one that's been made just for gardens. If you have a lawn tractor with a PTO to a pickup, this has been designed for people with a larger tractor that if you had this, technology. And the rotor crimpers can be as simple as a power pole, a log. Uh, if you find a used cultipactor out on an old farm, anything that would knock the cover crop down, smash it a little bit. We're not cutting it at all. We're just smashing it. But you can use a power pole. You can use a two by four, put it down, walk on it, put it back, walk on it. So any process that you figure, we want to lay that cover crop down smash it as much as possible. The bottom line, if you're going to do it organically, you got to get it up to fairly good maturity that's in bloom and that you shouldn't have to put any herb. Of course, if you're organic, you're not going to put any herbicides, but that should do the trick. Sometimes you'll have some that will escape. And I know if you're used to organics, as I work with organic farmers, one thing you learn to put your arms around some weeds because they're going to come in eventually. But anyway, that is one way you could do it. If you are using a little quasi-chemicals with your organic, uh, and I'm kind of that way, I would follow the organic principles, but I still use a little bit of herbicide here and there. You can pop it while it's on the ground and get a, a kill. So again, whether you're organic, whether you're conventional, whether you're something quasi in between, there's a way to do it. So here's the additional crimpers I talked about, plywood, Riding lawnmower, there's a, uh, if you'll go to the Coffee County Soil Conservation District, it shows them riding a lawnmower without the blade intact, 
just letting the deck knock the cover crop down. Now, I know some people recommend if that's the only way you can kill your cover crop, then mowing would be all right. I don't like to mow cover crops for two reasons. I like for that stem and root still to be intact so when we push it down, that root will continue to leak, exudates as it dies, as it rots. So I like to have the stem and the root still intact. But if the only way you can kill that is a lawnmower, yes, sir. What if you raise the mower deck? You can raise the mower deck. You cut it at a, 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 a short. A, a, you can uh, cut it. <coughs> yeah, that, that would work. I I like pushing the whole thing down. But if I can get people to do something quasi, then y'all, heavens help, get into this and try it. I do not like mowing, but if mowing's the way to get you into this, then do so. Well, some people really scalp their yards. Yes. Yes, if you're, uh, let's get into that a little bit. Photosynthesis, remember. So if you have a cool season grass, you should not be cutting more than three, three and a half inches, or you're going to have crabgrass and Bermuda grass, guaranteed. So when you write, when you do mowing and you've got a fescue yard, then go home and tell your husband, raise it up to three, three and a half inches. Because if you want crabgrass and Bermuda, you cut it at an inch like a lot of people do. I guarantee you, Bermuda and crabgrass. Good point. Larger gardens, compactors, poles, utility poles, and all that. And we've seen this done in large-scale agriculture. Anything to knock that down. But yeah, some of you try that riding lawnmower at a little higher depth. And try it. Landscape rollers. You'll see these big rollers that landscapers will lay sod down would work well too if you can get a hold of one of those maybe at a yard sale or something. This is what we would like to see. Now there's a lot of farmers that you saw the cover crop I have them. There'll be a lot of farmers go in and plant that just like it was standing. And they'll use their planter to knock it down. But if we can get it laying down like this, imagine that carpet laying down and choking out your weeds. And then as it rots with the cereal rye and the oats, barley and some of the others will do the same thing. We get that allopathy, the lethopathy, that as uh, little small weeds coming up, then the, these chemicals will kill those as they try to germinate. So termination options. Grow to a bloom stage or, or reproductive stage. Use any device to roll it, crimp it, knock it down. Roundup is, uh, well, you can use low rates of Roundup if you're using some chemicals. If you want to terminate earlier, and say maybe this stage, and it's not in bloom, then basically the only thing you can do is wipe the sun. I've got an organic farmer up in Washington County that she used to work with us. In fact, she was our associate chief, Dana York. She used to live here in Murfreesboro. Dana will take this black tarp and she'll put on her cover crops about April the 1st and then uh, for I don't know how many days, but enough days to kill it, and she'll block the sun, same principle as that straw a while ago. All right, mowing separates surface residue from root, increases decomposition. So that's another reason you're chopping it into small bits. The nematodes, the earthworms, the arthropods will attack it. If you've got plenty of residue, and all of that, then mowing would just speed up the process of decomposition. But again, if you've never done this, you're going to jump into cover crops, and that's the only way you would do it, then I say, heaven forbid, go ahead and mow. But if not, you can go to these other methods and try those. But if that's the only way you would try it, then I would say do it, but it's going to speed up the decomposition, and then you lose that root to uh, leaking the exudates. All right, additional weed control. As you go out through the season, and you know, we've killed this stuff probably, I think, uh, if you look at the uh, Kevin Brown, this was a late season. So normally he would have killed his around April the 20th this year. It was about April the 28th when you saw him in that field over his head. So we had greater height and coverage of termination, better weed suppression. So if you want to get the best out of your money for weed suppression, get it as high as you can. If you mow your yard and you use a push mower or you collected grass clippings, 
Then as you're planting your tomatoes and your corn, in between the rows, you can put grass clippings out there. Anything that's straw or grass can type some nitrogen. So make sure you're putting out, whether you're using organic, compost, manures, triple 15, whatever you're putting out, watch your plants. If they're starting to turn a little yellow and you have put out some grass clippings or some straw, then you could tie up some nutrients. So as this soil biology matures in year three, four, and five, you probably won't see that as much. But early on, we could see a little bit of yellowing of your plants, and it's because the excess carbon is starting to break down. The soil biology hadn't built up yet, so give it by year three or four to cycle that, and then you shouldn't have any problems. But grass clippings, put in the row additional straw, Make sure you make this, this is an important point, make sure your plants have enough nitrogen or nutrients. I've talked to uh, uh, Alan's cohort, uh, Adam, and uh, we talked about even using newspapers. Anything that would choke up the sun as you get later in July, August, where we're at now, to stop those weeds from coming on. If not, you can do the Santa Claus method and ho, 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 or weed eater. And any soil that is not covered during this process, number two, we are leaving ourselves open for, for weeds. So anytime we till, we bring up more weed seeds. So as much as we can keep it covered and choking out those weeds, the better. This is uh, Alan's after we laid it down or after he laid it down. I didn't help him, I just got the picture. <laughs> so you saw that massive stuff you can see he's laid it down. It was easy to manage and to plant at that point. There was his result. There's the garden. So you saw the seven foot tall cover crop. You saw it laid down. Then you saw the fruit of his labor. This is Kevin's and I've got several shots of Kevin's. So he's got some boxes that he's brought in some soil. He has all these other, this little area right here he got, it's about four foot wide and about 25 foot long, and he calls it a chaos garden. Now this is real edgy, what I'm about to say. So he'll take about 12 species of stuff that will grow this time of year. His main culprit that he wants is sweet corn. So he'll cyclone seed, uh, sweet corn, squash, Maybe some millet and all of that, and everything will come up. It's like an Easter egg hunt. You go out there and just pick what you can find. And that's getting a little more popular. But if you like the neat rows and you're kind of engineering minded, you want all these right angles and all that, that's not for you. But if you want to try a little section, take your bunch of species with corn, squash, green beans, the Indians caught it, three sisters, grow all that together. There's synergy with all those roots and everything, but that's something that he has tried. This is your, uh, so there's your cover crop laid down. You remember Kevin's was that high. You're able, it looks like straw, and so your plants are coming up. He uses a screwdriver on his small seeded stuff. He'll use, uh, uh, he'll just use a trowel for his tomatoes and things like that. And he grows 28 tomatoes in that small garden. There are some of his lettuces, his broccoli, some of the cold crops. There's some uh, uh, a winter pea. This is uh, what we call straw farming. These are just straw bales with a little compost soil, and he's growing tomatoes in that. That's getting some popularity. That's on the edge of his garden. And then he has his pole beans and some of his other crops. And so he breaks that down, and here he has his yard waste, his compost, and all of this, and then he'll continue to put compost, yard waste, and that as the season goes, because he has that cover crops, but as weeds come up, he's trying to be as organic as possible. He'll use Roundup, but then the rest of the season, he'll use organic principles, yard waste, straw, and stuff to choke out the weeds. There's his garden as I took this picture about uh, third week of May, second week of May. These are the 28 tomato plants. You see the vegetables in the background. This is in Williamson County, by the way. And then I was on a uh, big farm last week, day before the 4th of July. There was a 40-acre 
watermelon, and he grows 5,000 acres of corn, wheat, beans, tobacco, watermelons, 40 acres of watermelons, but he'll put borders of buckwheat. Buckwheat is a great blooming. It makes the soil softer. It pulls up phosphorus, so it's a great crop. I like it in a mix, but if you want to grow borders, bring in your honeybees and things like that, that. So more on Soil Health Gardens, go to the newsroom and Soil Health Heroes at tnacd.org. That's going to be on your bag. So there's the website. So get busy as a bee and plant those cover crops. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. Tell me about your mulch. So we usually just do a pine bark mulch, just you know, no dye, and not like you know, pretty mulch. Okay, nothing wrong with that except let me give you the warning label. All right. I've got a friend that married my third cousin, and he wanted to go more than what you did. So he put six inches of wood chips on his garden. I went, oh my, what we get into what we call carbon nitrogen ratios. So in the mix that you have, it will be anywhere from a 28 to 30, maybe 32, but probably the mix we got you is about a 28 to 1 carbon to nitrogen ratio. And what that means is in nature, you have an 8 to 1 carbon nitrogen ratio, sometimes 10 to 1 depending on the carbon at the site. So nature wants to be 8 to 1 carbon nitrogen ratio. So when you have something like a 28 to 1, it takes a while the critters to break it down, and that's why we shoot for 28 to 1, because we don't want to put just buckwheat or lettuce out there, because when you kill lettuce, it's done in three or four days, the biology. That's what we call a low carbon nitrogen ratio. An oak tree would be, I don't know what the carbon nitrogen, but sawdust is 400 to 1. So when you put wood chips or mulch out there, you have raised that carbon nitrogen ratio. So the only thing that I would warn you on, like a real hungry nutrient crop, is pumpkins. So if you've got pumpkins and wood chips, they start to turn yellow. You either put a triple 15 if you're chemical or a compost or hog manure or chicken manure with that. So anything that has a woody cellulose, it's going to be harder to break down for the soil biology. So that's why I like straw a little better, even though it will bring up some seed. you got to ho-ho-ho it, weed it, or kill it. Uh, but this cover crop will give you the living cover and then add that as an amendment. And so um, what about pine straw? Is that something like Pine straw is a little more carbon uh, nitrogen than, than grass straw because it came from a pine tree. So. I don't know the chemical breakdown of carbon nitrogen ratio, but it's going to last. If you see pine needles in a in a forest, it's going to last longer than say straw wood, and that's because it's got a higher carbon so you're nitrogen really ratio. Really looking for that something that will break. A little lower that would break down. Now the best thing that will break this stuff down is put a bunch of nitrogen on it. Right. When you put nitrogen on it, it will disappear in a hurry. Okay. Now I have a pic. I don't have a picture today. I have a picture on my phone. I'll show you in a minute. But we had no-till tobacco up in Robertson County. The cover crop was this high, so it's about like his. You won't see much residue on the ground because he put 30 units of nitrogen and it ate it up. The biology says, hey, I've got more nitrogen, and they break down. When they have nitrogen, they feed, and they break down the carbon quicker. So if you have a higher carbon nitrogen ratio, if you put a little more nitrogen than normal, it will break it down real quicker. Somebody else? Yes, sir, in the back. All these crops you're missing are annual crops. What if you've got a perennial there? If you have a perennial, uh, you got a perennial, it's not going to die, it's going to continue to grow. So that's the only thing. <laughs> so I want my cover crop to be dead when I plant my crop. Now, when you grow in the garden, you're not making, unless, if you're not making a living on it, 
you can have a perennial, you can try to grow crops, but they're going to compete for water, nutrients, and all that, and shade, and all that. So that's why I like annuals, because you want it to cut the crop, you want it to die, and then you want your annual crops, which you're making your money or growing your vegetables on. The perennials, and if you want to kill your perennials and then they bounce back up, fine, but uh, most of the time if you hit them with this and stuff to do the termination, they're not going to come back. Uh, I don't want to grow my asparagus in no, no, I'm talking about the cover crop. Yeah, your, your asparagus and things like that that's a perennial. Yes, you, once you plant them, they will continue to do their thing, and you will have a section in your garden, and you won't have to get asparagus section up. I'm using the shoe question. What I'm used to doing now is strawberries that make strawberries cover crop. And anything that's a biennial, you know, which is like this, that and anything that's a biennial with strawberries is asparagus is a perennial. You would put them on another section of the garden because they would continue to do their life cycle and you do cover crops around them. This is for your annual cropping, but yeah, for your perennials, your annuals, and stuff like that, you would have them in a different section. I'm sorry, I thought you meant planting fish here or something. Somebody else? Yes, ma'am. Animal manure can be your nitrogen for the Yes, yes. Animal manure is uh, got lower amounts of nitrogen so it breaks down a little slower, but once the season warms up, you have available nitrogen. So a lot of people with the, uh, the uh, more of a higher carbon nitrogen makes it for compost, which is a lower carbon nitrogen ratio, or manure, which is a lower carbon nitrogen ratio, it will speed up the plant down. Anytime you put the manure on, you've got to increase the soil knowledge. They will go wild and turn on manure. That's why that's their job. Earthworms will quadruple. If you're currently using a rototiller, you go to any type of this system I'd talk about, you'll go four times, five times, ten times earthworms in two to three years, guaranteed. Mm -hmm. Earthworms are good. They do the tilling of the soil. They bring organic matter down, subsoil down, nutrients. Also, we have found, and we this is anecdotal, but it's through soil tests. It's not... Uh, it's not the uh, <coughs> referee journal research, but I know a farm in Jefferson County, he's been growing cover crops for 80, uh, since 1985. By soil test, he has not called for any potassium or lime for five years. Now what we're seeing on that is these roots are getting deeper and deeper and deeper. For a while, we used to farm the top six inches of the soil now we're going down, maybe getting as deep as 56, 60 inches, pulling up nutrients, calcium, and things that we haven't seen before. So we're seeing some long-term, 30 years, 20 years, 5 years of stuff, where we're starting to see a little reduction in need for nutrients based on soil tests. I won't promise that for you early on. The longer you're in the system, the more you'll see those type benefits. You will see weed control suppression. You will see more water going into your garden the first year and a lot more by the third year. You'll start to see little earthworm casts by year four. This is earthworm poop, and it has five to 12 times more phosphorus and nitrogen. You'll start to see it piling up uh, on your soil surface by year four, year five. I have seen it as much as year three. So all of these things will start to improve your soil. Somebody else? Yes, sir. Talking about water conservation and the need for water and eliminating the need for water. Yes. Thank you. Got it. On, on Kevin, he lives in Williamson County, Franklin. Water is expensive. Uh, with that system that you saw, I... I don't want to misquote him, but I don't think he has watered in two to three years. And you know the drought of 2016. So first of all, if you're not pulverizing the soil, you're keeping the soil covered, you're keeping it cooler, you all that, you got less evaporation. Number two, if I am doubling or tripling or quadrupling my infiltration rate, which I certainly will, I'm putting more water in the ground. Number three, 
My soil organic matter, we know if we raise it by 1%, we can hold about 27,000 gallons more water. So first of all, I got less stress because it's cooler and I got it covered. If you put straw in your garden, it's wetter than if you plowed it up and it's bare. I think you all know that. So I've got that. So water's infiltrating better. I'm holding more water. And so probably a system like this, unless you just saw a steep landscape like it where I live, you probably on most years wouldn't have to water. If you did water, you're going to water one-tenth of what you would have to normally. A lot less water needs with this system, and that's why we're promoting it on large farms. Yes, sir? Color of the mulch. Do what? Color of the mulch after you, after you prep that. Is it better to have a dark-colored mulch or a light-colored mulch? Most of the time, we have a rye color, which is uh, more of a uh, little darker. Not, it's not dark, but it's about the shade of a wheat straw, maybe a little darker. So it's, it's about the color of straw. Wait, you see a lot of people buy these dark colored mulches. Yes. What do you say about those? Well, they hold more heat. A lighter will reflect, but as far as on cover crops, I go more for what the species does uh, for the root system, the uptake, the alethopathy, the cover it gives, the combinations of all, and whatever the color of the mulch is, is the color of the mulch. I haven't got that much in there. That's something called the pink and pink But this will be, this will be the color generally of a wheat straw, but you have the, of course, the radish is more down in the winter. You'll see the hose in the soil. The turnips will be a little different color. So remember, we got five species to deal with. We got the Austrian winter pea will be a different color, but by May 1st, the biology is eating it up. So the, what's going to remain is your oats and your rye, and it will be a different color of each side. So medium light color, I guess, would be the answer. Light yellow. Yes, sir. <laughs> Somebody else? Does everybody want a bag of seed, I assume? Oh, yeah. Yes, sir. If you got a larger garden, yes, sir. you knock it down. Yes, sir. You're planting beans two inches apart. Planting what? Say you plant a row of beans. Yeah. Several rows of beans. Yeah. Two inches apart. Yeah. It seems impractical to take a screwdriver or every hole and put it to the ground. Is there another way to cut you a row to be able to get that? Yeah, you can. Um, and and uh, I talked about this. If you want to. You know, in a garden where everything's disturbed, you take a hoe and make a little V trench and do that. Well, when you got straw and stuff on the ground, it's a little more difficult. Now, one way to mechanize that a little bit would be like a yard edger, you know, a yard you know, edger that cuts that. That would cut your trench. Now, beware, you're, you're disturbing the soil a little bit, and you'll have more weeds in that area. But it's a mechanized way. And I'm just giving you ideas, screwdriver, edger, uh, anything that disturbs the ground brings it up, but it makes work easier. So play around with it. Those are areas where you might want to put a little extra straw because you will have weeds if you open an edge up, plant your peas. Now one thing, if you go into a lot of gardens, I notice you still have 38 inch rows. You know how we got 38 inch rows? Does, does people still grow 38 inch rows or 40 inch rows or does anybody still do that? Yeah, it was the it was the size of the bud of a horse or a mule. And a lot of people will still grow wide rows. And the only reason it was because the horse and mule to go in and cultivate. So narrow those rows. You don't need a big row because I hope you get rid of your rototiller and put a mailbox on it. Uh, but you know, you don't need wide rows, so you can plant your peas and beans at a more narrow than you used to. Somebody else? All right, if I can have some assistance and uh, we'll get out the seed here. Now when you talk about this, they took 2,500 pounds of seed and mix and we're trying to have as pure mix as possible. So, so you'll see the mix on there. And you'll see the dimensions. So if you forgot everything I said, most of it's written on there. Thank you. You got the website on the bag.
If you have friends or family that you know would utilize this, I don't want you to take the seed and it go to waste because there's a lot of effort and money in this. But if you have someone that you can influence to do this, I would be glad to give you an extra bag or bags. I got it. Your job is to get this planted, preach the gospel, and the crops. When is the best time to plant it? Oh, good question. Yeah, that's that's the same thing. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I meant to cover that, and I'll add this to my presentation. When's the best time to plant this? It's a winter cover crop, so about the time your garden is playing out. Now, if you have turnip greens and mustards and that, you can keep that as your uh, uh, greens, uh, uh, as your uh, harvestable crop. If you want to overseed this into your greens, then we have some uh, turnips anyway, so you're going to have more turnips and radishes in there. I would plant no, not much earlier than the end of August and as late as October the 15th. You go past October 15th, your radishes and your turnips not going to come up well. I would shoot for early, mid-September would be ideal. But I know all of you garden differently. So your range is about Octo August the 31st, about October 15th. If you go later than that, then you need to go with your own cover crop seed and go more with the rise and the Austrian winter peas. But for this mix, you don't want to be any later than October 15th, but your radish and tournament, turnips will suffer. So in September would be even be better. So great question. And uh, NRCS extension, they have seeding dates for these, so any questions you can come by the local district office, NRCS office, extension office. They can give you a seeding guide for all the seeds, not just these. So I'll turn it back over to Heather unless you all have questions. Does anybody want any extra bags for like a neighbor, a family member, something like that to take home? You want 